will be held on the 4th to the 5th of June 2018 from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. at NUS Faculty of Engineering. You can find out more at this website. I will upload I will upload this information on LMS, okay? But this is for your information. If you are interested to participate, you have to sign up. Now, why should you participate in this CAMI challenge? Okay, this is because it can bring you, give you more insight into the undergraduate curriculum of engineering if that is one of the courses that you are considering. Okay, and it will help you to learn new concepts and gain fresh insights. Also, you get to represent RV. Alright, and there are attractive prizes awarded to top teams. Okay, so how do you participate? Take note that. Is this a chit chat session now? Huh? Are you in the cinema? This is an announcement, but it's still important, okay? You might not want to listen, but other people want to listen. So you keep quiet. The deadline for registration is the 2nd of April, okay? And the cost of registration is $12 per student. Considering if you win and you get attractive prizes, you will more than even out. Huh? You can sign up at tinyurl.com slash uh, NUS Camp E hyphen RBHS. So as mentioned, right, these two slides will be uploaded on LMS for those of you who are interested to participate. Okay? So uh, once you once you sign up, then we will form you, we will group you into <coughs> teams of five and then you will represent RB to compete in the Camp e challenge. Okay? So now we begin the lecture proper. If an egg is broken by an outside force, life ends. If broken by an inside force, life begins. Right? Great things always begin from the inside. How is this related to chemistry? No, not one thing. The aim of me sharing this with you. You want to listen or not? Is Hopefully, this will be your inspiration for the week and it can be something that you take with you. If not for the week, but at least for the next 50 something minutes or so of my lecture. Alright, I hope that this being my first lecture with you, oh, by the way, I have to intro myself. I'm Miss Chua. Huh? Okay, so uh, I will be taking you through Geisha State and later on Reaction Kinetics. Shh. Ah, I do not like to do all this shh thing. Huh? Okay, you are 17 years old. Next year, you are going to take A levels. Alright, I do not want to, want to treat you as if you are 7 years old, 8 years old. I do not want to keep scolding you because rightly so you are young adults. Alright, I believe in mutual respect, okay? Me being prepared for the lecture, you being prepared for the lecture, bringing your notes, doing whatever you need to do. Alright, so I hope that, you know, when you come for lessons in school, be it for chemistry lecture or whatsoever other lectures or tutorials, know that great things always begin on from the inside, okay? If you yourself are not motivated, if you find that lectures, tutorials are a waste of time, then you realise that when you go back home, you need to spend even more time on your study materials, okay? And there is an opportunity cost to it, okay? You don't need to be an economist to know that. Alright, so I hope that, you know, you'll find purpose in attending the lecture and learning. And in so, by doing so, okay, everybody creates a more conducive environment for the lecture. Is that clear? If not, uh, I will be one of the external forces that will break you from the outside and then you become overlooked. Okay, you want that? Okay, so this is an independent learning topic, uh, you just did. Why is it independent learning? It's because it's supposed to be quite easy for you to understand. That's why it's independent. Alright? But, <clears throat> nevertheless, I will do a quick summary of the important things that you need to know. So those of you who have brought the lecture notes, okay, you can just mark out the important points in your notes. Take note, nah, I say important points, but it's not that the other points are out of syllabus. The other points, you will still need to read up in order to get a holistic picture of the topic. Okay, but these are the key points, alright? So, you have five basic assumptions of kinetic theory of matter. Note that assumptions two and three are highlighted. 
because these are the two most important concepts uh, in chemistry, okay, in the H2 chemistry syllabus, and you need to know them by heart, memorize. Okay, you need to know these two concepts by heart because these two are the most relevant to chemistry. Alright, so this is the basic assumptions of kinetic theory. The next thing you need to know, of course, is PV equals to MRT. This is the most important equation. Okay, take note that in this equation, there are five terms. P is for pressure in terms of Pascal or Newton per meter squared. Alright, volume is in meter cube. N is your amount in mole. R is what we call the molar gas constant. The data, right, 8.31 joules per Kelvin per mole. This one actually can be found from your data booklet. But you might as well have to write it because it's just 3 digits, 8.31. Okay, and then last one, T is the temperature. Take note, it's in Kelvin, not degrees Celsius. Okay, now it is important to convert the units provided uh, to the SI units to be used in the ideal gas equation whenever you are trying to solve the questions. Okay, so take note that whatever um, numbers that you use, whatever numbers that you fill into the equation, okay, it has to be in the correct units. Okay, then. Branching off from the ideal gas equation, there are three laws that we will need to know. First one will be known as Boyle's law. Okay, Boyle's law states that at constant temperature, the volume of fixed mass of gas is inversely proportional to its pressure. Okay, that means to say that when temperature and uh, the mass of the gas is constant, uh, PV is constant. Right? If you imagine the if you picture the ideal gas equation, PV is equal to nRT, at constant temperature, PV is equal to a constant value. Okay? Therefore, P1V1 is equal to P2V2. Later on, as we go through the tutorial, we will then see how we can use all these laws to help us to solve the questions. Alright? The second law that you need to know is Charles' law. Okay? Charles' law is about constant pressure. Again, the condition is that it must be for a fixed mass of gas. Okay? And it states that your volume is directly proportional to temperature. The temperature must be in Kelvin uh, at constant pressure and for a fixed mass of gas. Therefore, we can draw the relation that V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2, where V1 and V2 are the volumes at T1 and T2 respectively. Okay? And then lastly, you have your Avogadro's Law. You would have come across Avogadro's Law when you learned atoms, molecules and stoichiometry. Okay, so this is where at constant temperature and pressure, okay, the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the number of moles of the gas. So volume is directly proportional to amount. Therefore, we can draw the relation V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over M2. Okay. So, think about that for Avogadro's law, this would follow that the volume occupied by one mole of any gas, okay, must be constant, okay. So this will be known as the molar volume. So one mole of any gas will give you a fixed volume, and the volume is dependent on the physical condition, temperature, and pressure. So you learned about two different conditions, right? First is the STP, the other one is the RTP. You need to know at STP what is the temperature and the volume, and for RTP what is the temperature and the volume. Okay? So at STP, take note that the molar volume is 22.7 dm cube per mole. Take note of the units. At RTP, the molar volume is 24 dm cube per mole. Okay? So of course STP is at 0 degrees Celsius, 1 bar. RTP is at 20 degrees Celsius and 1 atmosphere. Okay, so 1 bar and 1, at, at one atmosphere is actually different in terms of Pascal. <laughs> okay, so um, you also have derivations from the ideal gas equation. Okay, this is to describe the changes that occur for a fixed amount of gas where N is constant because the amount is fixed under two different sets of conditions. So, Based on the ideal gas equation, we are able to get the equation of state for an ideal gas where P1, P1 over T1 is equal to P2, P2 over T2. Again, this is because PV is equal to nRT. Right? 
So R is always a constant at 8.31. N, we say it's a fixed mass of gas, therefore N is also a constant. So if you bring T to the left hand side of the equation, you get PV over T. So PV over T is equal to a constant here, that's why you can have this relation. Okay? And then moving on, we also want to talk about the Dalton's law of partial pressure. Okay, this is for a mixture of non-reacting gases. Okay, the gases do not react with each other. Okay, so um, each gas will exert its own pressure independent of the other gases, known as known as its partial pressure. Okay, so partial pressure of any gas is equal to its small fraction times the total pressure. Okay, this is the formula to use, huh? When you have a mixture of non-reacting gases, you want to find what is the pressure exerted by one type of gas. Okay, this will be the formula that you use. So take note that since the pressure of the particle gas A is equal to the amount times RT over V, okay, it follows that um, your partial pressure will only change if the amount, temperature or volume changes. Okay, so you, you should be clear about this because students might tend to be confused like, you know, if you add other things, then uh, what will happen to the partial pressure, so on and so forth, okay? Now, this is about ideal gas. As we know, ideal gas, they don't exist because this is reality, okay? But we need the ideal, uh, we need the ideal gas equation and we need to know about this so as to help us to predict, okay, about uh, real gases. So, there are differences between ideal gas and real gas. Okay, and in particular, right, to the assumptions 2 and 3 of the basic theory of matter, basic kinetic theory of matter. Okay, uh, the difference is that for ideal gas, we assume that they have negligible volume or size compared to the volume of the container. But in reality, gas particles have a definite volume. Okay, they do occupy a certain amount of space. Okay, so that is the first difference. The other difference is that for an ideal gas, the gas particles exert negligible intermolecular forces on one another. Now you have learned chemical bonding, you know that this is not true, okay? And there are intermolecular forces at play, okay, between the gas particles. And the strength of these forces will vary from different gases to one another. Okay, because we have three types of intermolecular forces, right? IDID, PDPD, and hydrogen bonds. So all these three the strengths vary. Alright, but you need to know that they exist, okay, intermolecular forces exist. So, for an ideal gas, if you were to plot PV over RT against P for a fixed mass of gas at one mole, okay, the graph will look like a straight line, horizontal straight line. Okay, because PV over RT is a constant, right? However, for a real gas, there is going to be a deviation. So, you see that um, this real gas actually does not follow the PV over RT relationship at certain points. Okay, so we say that the assumption that the gas is ideal when using the ideal gas equation is valid only over a limited range of temperature and pressure. Okay, so you see over here, right? After this certain point of pressure, the gas just, the real gas just goes completely different from whatever behavior that the ideal gas law is trying to predict. Okay, and it's only during over this range that it is rather similar, although there is still some deviation. So, we say that the extent of deviation from ideal behavior really depends on the pressure and temperature, okay, of the operating system, as well as the nature of the gas. What is the identity of the gas that we're talking about? Okay, because this will impact the size of the electron cloud as well as its polarity and hence the intermolecular forces. Okay, so now we know that real gas will deviate, right? This is particularly so at higher pressure and lower temperatures. Okay, for gases, uh, okay, the, this is, this is the, the x-axis is actually the pressure. You see that quite self-explanatory huh? that when you as pressure increases okay the you see the plot it tends to deviate more and more from the horizontal line right so therefore it's quite easy to understand that at higher pressure the real gas will deviate more from ideal behavior then what about temperature 
You see these three lines, the green one, the red and the, this purple line? Okay, this is at 200 Kelvin, 500 and 1000. The lower the temperature, the greater the deviation of the real gas from ideal behaviour. Okay, so therefore we say that the real gas will deviate more at higher pressure and lower temperature. Okay, so con uh, commonly speaking, that means that at high temperatures and low pressure, a real gas will tend towards ideal behaviour. Okay, so this is a summary. Now we will move on to the tutorial questions one to six. I hope you all have done it. We will go through question six first, then five, then one to four. Are you all ready? Okay, question six. Question six, you have a 20 dm cube plus containing 0.2 moles of methane and 0.8 moles of oxygen at 127 degrees Celsius. You are asked to calculate the total pressure in the flask. Okay, so we know that there is a mixture of gases. We assume that, right, this is at the instant, right at the start, okay, before methane and oxygen reacts with each other. So this is right at the start. Huh? Okay, so um, to calculate the total pressure, firstly, you will need to find the total amount, which is equal to 1 mole. And using the equation, PV equals to NRT, you substitute in the values, you should be able to get the answer 1.66 times 10 to the power 5 Pascal. Things to take note, temperature must be converted to Kelvin, so 273 plus 127. And volume, in this case you are given the volume in dm cube. Have you converted it to meters cube? So generally, 1 meter cube is equal to 1 times 10 to the power of 3 dm cube, is equal to 1 times 10 to the power of 6 cm cube. Okay, please know your conversions. Part B, part B asks you to calculate the partial pressure of each gas. Okay, so you have found the total pressure, you are asked to calculate the partial pressure. What is the formula to use to calculate the partial pressure of each gas? Just not in the summary you went through, right? Okay, let's have a 5D, chem wrap of 5D. Where's 5D? 5D is there. Huh? Where's the chem wrap? Or the... What is the formula? Okay, amount of the particular gas over a total amount of gas times total pressure. Good. So you apply it to methane and then to oxygen. That should give you the answer. Okay, very simple calculations. Next, huh? Part C. Write a balanced equation including state symbols for the complete combustion of methane and oxygen at a temperature of 127 degrees C. Okay, so let's see. Uh, five. Very boring for me to just rent on, right? So I might as well call you to answer the question. 5N. 5N. Where's 5N? N. N for Norway. Where's 5N? Raise your hand, Nick. 
Okay, uh, class chairperson of 5N. Male class chairperson, because just now a female answer. Male class chairperson of 5N. Can you give me your balance equation including state symbols? CH4 gas. Plus 202 gas. Give you CO2 gas. Plus 2H2O gas. Very good. Okay, so that's correct. So he's sharp enough to notice that the operating temperature is at 127 degrees C. At that temperature, your water don't exist as liquid water, it exists as steam. Okay, so the state symbol for water must be gaseous. Okay? Other than that, this is a very straightforward combustion equation. Huh? <coughs> then part D, make sure the flask was sparked so that the methane completely burnt in oxygen. What is the final pressure in the flask measured at 127 degrees Celsius? Okay, so this is the combustion equation from the previous part. Okay, take note that after the combustion reaction, the gases that are left in the flask will be your excess oxygen, CO2 and steam. Agree? Okay, because the methane would have been completely reacted. Okay, and you will need to factor in water because it is gaseous. Right? And all the gases will contribute to the pressure at that point in time. So therefore, we need to find all the respective amounts of the excess O2, the CO2 and the H2O and then we can proceed to find what is the total pressure, right? So the amount of O2, we can use Avogadro's, uh, we can just use the stoichiometric ratio to find. Since we know that there is 0.2 moles of methane to, to begin with, then we know that the O2 reacted is 0.4, therefore O2 excess will be the total Volume, the total amount of O2 that, that was added minus the one that is reacted. Amount of CO2 formed is equal to 0.2 because the stoichiometric ratio is 1 is to 1. And then likewise, we compare stoichiometric ratio, amount of water is 0.4. Total amount after combustion is 1 more. Since the total amount of gases after and before combustion are the same, therefore we can conclude that the final pressure is also equal to 1.66. Okay. Okay, so next. You should have already done it, what? So you just tick, tick, tick only, right? You mean you got it wrong, ah? Okay, then you copy, don't use your mouth, huh? use your hand, use your, use your pen. And how would you predict the average MR change as the temperature is increased? 
Okay, so all the data has been given to you. So you are supposed to find out something from the given data so that you can guess what is the molecular state of ALCL3 at this temperature and use it to predict the average MR, how will it change? Okay, now based on your prior knowledge in chem bonding, aluminium chloride. Aluminium chloride can undergo what kind of a behavior? What is special about aluminium chloride? It can undergo dimerization. Right, so there is a chance that it may exist instead of AlCl3, it may exist as Al2Cl6. So using all this data, how would that help to find out whether it is AlCl3 or Al2Cl6? You can, you, you, you will know that AlCl3 differs from Al2Cl6 by the relative molecular mass, right? So how can you use the data to find the relative molecular mass? Okay, so take note that when we say PV is equal to NRT, the amount can be equated to mass over molar mass. So from here, if you substitute in M over the big M, you can find out what is the molar mass of the aluminium chloride. Okay, so you substitute in all the values according to the SI units, you should be able to get 263 as the average MR. Okay, 263 is the average MR of the aluminium chloride. Then you go and find out AlCl3, what is the molar mass? You see that for AlCl3, right, the molar mass is actually about, is 133.5 and this is approximately half of 263, what we have found out. Okay, so therefore we can say that at 100 degrees Celsius, okay, your aluminium chloride exists mainly as dimers formed through the leaf bonding between the two aluminium chloride monomers. Okay, so the structure will look like this. This one you will have uh, done in chem bonding tutorial. is increased, okay, the average MR will decrease as the dimers begin to dissociate into the ALCL3 monomers, okay. This is quite understandable uh, because when temperature is increased, heat is supplied to the system, energy is supplied to the system, and then when energy is supplied to the system, your bonds will begin to break, okay. Therefore, the dimers can break down into its respective monomers. So you will expect the MR to decrease. Questions 1 to 4 of the tutorial. Question 1 to 4 are MCQs.
So we should have enough time to go through all four questions. Question one. Now, if you did not do the tutorial, huh, I'm not giving you the opportunity to try it on your own. Why? Last week, Mrs. Po already told you way in advance that we'll be going through today, questions one to six. She gave you a reminder on Wednesday. First time she said it was Monday, right? Then she reminded you again on Wednesday. I think there's still a significant number of you who did not do. Every question that you fail to do on your own, you miss out on an opportunity to process the learning. Okay? And this loss is not mine. This loss is yours. Alright, so if you want to do, I'm not going to waste the time of people who have attempted at home and tell you that you can do it in lecture. I won't do that. Alright, you miss out on it, then too bad. You miss out on the learning, maybe you will not fare so well for the next test then. Okay, then you will just have to learn it the hard way. Alright, we will just continue on and you will answer the questions uh, when I pose it to you as need be. Question one, uh, so this plus X contains 1 dm cube of helium, 2 kilopascals, and plus Y contains 2 dm cube of neon at 1 kilopascal. Okay, so the plus are connected at constant temperature. What is the final pressure? <coughs> now, first thing is, the question to ask yourself uh, is, you have 2 plus X and Y. The nature of the gas, helium and neon. There are two different gases, right? So, how do you go about it? Are they gases that can react with each other? No, because one is neon, right? So everybody knows that neon is, in a very crude term, a noble gas. Okay, so it's a hint to you that these two gases are non-reacting. Therefore, you can apply your Dalton's law of partial pressure, right? In order to find out what is the final pressure. So, what is the answer that you get? Let's see, ah. Uh. 5E Kelly. 5E Kelly. What is your answer? Your answer is A. Okay, so, the answer, the correct answer is A. Now, let's see how we solve it, okay? Uh, what law do we use to find the partial pressure? Boyle's law, Charles law, or Avogadro's law? <laughs> Recall, uh, Boyle's law is about constant what? Constant. Let's get another person from 5E, or since we are still on question 1. Index number 20, 20, Meijia. Where is the index number 20, Meijia? Boyle's law talks about constant temperature. Okay? Then what about Charles Law? Index number 23, Charles. Constant. Charles Law is about constant pressure. Okay? And then Avogadro's law, that one we know is about a uh, fixed mass of gas at a uh, same pressure and temperature. Okay? So, in this case, what law should we use? Is there any other line there, what? This question. You use Boyle's law. Okay? Use Boyle's law to help you to solve for the MCQ. Okay, so. Total pressure that will be uh, that's occupied by the gases after the plus are connected. Assuming that the connector is of negligible volume, okay, is 3 dm cube. So we use Boyle's law, P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. For the pressure of helium, okay, we can find that it is actually 2 over 3 kPa. And for neon, it will be same thing, 2 over 3 kPa. Therefore, the total pressure will be equal to 1 and 1 third kilopascal. Okay, so that's how you get option A and answer.
Okay, moving on, question two. <coughs> question two, huh? you have a two gram sample of hydrogen at a particular temperature, pressure, excess of pressure, uh, temperature and volume exerting a pressure P. Now, deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. So, which of the following would also exert the same pressure P at the same temperature? So, you have the four choices, huh? Whether is it 2 grams of deuterium at volume V, 4 grams at V over 2, mixture of hydrogen and deuterium, or mixture of hydrogen and deuterium at a different uh, volume. Okay, so what is your answer? 5H. Five H. Uh, can I have the female class chairperson? What is your answer for question two? Option C. Okay. Option C. Do you think she's correct? What about the rest of you? What do you think? Don't know because never do, huh? Okay. The correct answer is C. Okay. So how do we solve for it? <laughs> Okay, again, uh, using PV is equal to NRT. This is like the only equation that you need to know. Alright. So, using PV is equal to NRT, right? Okay, pressure over temperature, you bring the temperature to the left hand side, is equal to NR over V. La. So, for a sample of gas to also exert pressure P at temperature T, okay, the ratio N over V should be the same. Okay, because R is a constant. Okay? So, based on the question, okay, you have 2 grams of hydrogen. Now, hydrogen, the amount will be equal to 2 over 2, okay, because it exists as H2. So, your expression for N over V will be equal to 1 over V. The objective is to find which one of these 4 choices will give you the same N over V expression. Okay? So, I repeat, uh, the objective is to find which of those four options will give you the same N over V expression of 1 over volume. So let's evaluate them option by option. For option A, N over V, right, because this is 2 grams of deuterium or volume V, so the molar mass of deuterium will be 4. Therefore, the amount is 2 over 4, and then simplifying, you get 1 over 2V. Okay, it's not the same, therefore it's not the answer. For option B, Okay, you have 4 grams of deuterium at volume V over 2. So you substitute them in accordingly. You get 2 over V as the expression. Okay, so again, it's not a mistake. <coughs> then we take a look at the option C. Huh? We give you a while to process this. For option C, the N over V expression, right, because you have a mixture of hydrogen and deuterium gases, okay, you have 1 gram of hydrogen, 2 grams of deuterium, so you find their respective amount and sum them together to find the total amount. It's the total volume of V, so simplifying, you actually get 1 over V as the simplest form. Okay, so this is the same as your as the N over V expression in the question, therefore this will be the answer. How to verify? Option D is a mixture of 2 grams of hydrogen and 1 gram of deuterium. So again, you find the respective amount, add them together, you get 5 over 8 V. Because this over here is a total volume of 2 V. Alright, so out of the 4 options, only option C gives you the same N over V expression. So that's why your answer is C. Okay?
in question three. Can we move on? Question three, huh? For question three, this is an actual uh, A-level question, huh? You write, you, whenever you see this, it means that it's an actual A-level question, huh? From November 92, paper four, question 31. Okay, so they tell you that the gas laws can be summarized in the ideal gas equation, PV is equal to NRT, each symbol has its usual meaning. Which of the following statements are correct? Okay, so let's ask the folks from 5J. Statement 1. One more of any gas... One more of any ideal gas occupies the same volume under the same condition of temperature and pressure. Option 2. Density of any ideal gas at constant pressure is inversely proportional to temperature. And option 3. Volume of a given mass of an ideal gas is double if its temperature is raised from 25 degrees. Okay, option one. Okay, your task is to, to evaluate whether the statements are correct or false. Huh? So 5J, 5J, can I have the... Jolene? Can 5J? 5J, Jolene, can you raise your hand? Ah, okay. Option one, is it correct or incorrect? Correct. Okay, so statement one is one more of any ideal gas occupies the same volume under the same conditions of temperature and pressure. It is correct, huh? okay, because it's according to Avogadro's law, volume is directly proportional to amount. What about option two? Density of any ideal gas at constant pressure is inversely proportional to the temperature. 5K. 5K, um, George. Where's George? So to the other. Right the end there. So option two, is it correct or incorrect? You don't think so. Is that your final answer? Do you want to ask a friend? No, I'm just kidding. So you think it's incorrect? Okay, let's see. Yeah. Okay, option two is actually correct. Okay? So you need to manipulate the you need to manipulate your ideal gas equation. Okay? Now there is PV is equals to NRT, right? So you need to know that your because now we're talking about density, so somehow we need to have the density term in the expression. Density is equal to mass over volume. Alright? So for volume, volume will then be equal to mass over density. Okay, at the same time, for the amount N, right? N is equal to mass over molar mass. So you realize that the mass terms on both sides will cancel out of each other. Therefore, reducing the entire expression to rho is equal to PM over RT. So P, uh, rho, is directly, is inversely proportional to temperature at constant pressure. So this is actually a correct statement. To convince yourself, you should try to simplify the equation on your own. Huh? And then uh, option three. Option three, is it correct or incorrect? 5L. Five L, can I have uh, Joyce? <coughs> Five L, that's Joyce. Huh? Joyce is not here. Wen <laughs> Rong, ah. Wen Rong is like very popular. Oh, uh, where's Wen Rong? Yeah. So option three, correct or incorrect? Option 3 is incorrect. Why? Because you feel that it's incorrect. That's not a correct answer, you know? But why is it incorrect? You need to know why. Let's ask someone, another person from 5L, huh? since your classmate don't know how to answer. Ryan. 
but the actual volume here is 20.5, which is higher than 19. So if the gas dimerizes, the, the actual volume will be lower than 19 and not higher. Okay, so that's why option 2 is incorrect. Now what about option 3? For option 3, we say that the gas is at, uh, the statement says that the gas is adsorbed onto the vessel walls. This is not a typo. Adsorption is different from absorption. Okay? So what is the meaning of adsorption? It is the adhesion of particles to a surface, simply put. Okay, adhesion of a particle of particles to a surface. So in application to question 4, is the adhesion of gaseous particles to the surface of the container or the cylinder which contains it. So you can imagine if the gaseous particles are adhering to the surface, the, the amount of the gaseous particles calculated will be lower. Okay? However, again, this is 20.5 compared to 19 is higher. Therefore, we know that option 3 is incorrect. Okay? So for the remaining questions, uh, for the rest of the tutorial, your tutors will go through in class with you. Please make sure that you have adequately prepared it. Okay, your tutors will go through with you after Energetics 1. On Wednesday, okay, we will start on Energetics 2. Make sure you have your lecture notes with you. Okay, so we'll call it a day. Thank you.